Okay, uh, today we're going over chapter 12, uh, link state and hybrid routing protocols. This is going to be uh, basically a repeat of uh, what we covered on Friday. And then uh, whenever we come back this next Friday, we'll actually get into the switching operations stuff. But for right now, link state and hybrid routing protocols. Um, so this is going to cover uh, OSPF and EIGRP primarily. Um, so. We talked about uh, previously distance vector uh, routing protocols. Um, we're talking about these other protocols now because of the limitations that distance vector has. Um, uh, you know, RIP in particular uh, is not a good candidate for larger networks because it uses a um, a single metric of uh, hop count, and the maximum hop count on RIP is 15. So you can't go beyond 15 hops. So it doesn't uh, it doesn't work well for really large networks. Um, it's also got slow reaction times to topology changes, uh, which can hinder convergence and scalability. So whenever there's a change in RIP, because of the amount of time it, it takes to change, um, it's not as versatile as some of these other routing protocols we're going to talk about. Um, link state and hybrid routing protocols are used to overcome uh, some of these limitations. Um, so link state routing protocols have full knowledge of the network, whereas distance vector protocols rely on routing by rumor. Um, they will we'll kind of get into the specifics of it, but they, they basically go through a process of first identifying their neighbors, all of the routers in that network that are going to be running that routing protocol. They f form neighbor relationships. Then they share uh, topology information with each other so that uh, each router gets a, a full vision of the topology of the network. And then each router individually runs a, an algorithm to determine the best route. So you've, rather than you know, with RIP or other distance vector routing protocols, relying on what the router right next to you told you is the best route to, to get to somewhere and then adding one onto that. You've got, uh, each router has a much better vision of the full network so they're able to, uh, you know, identify the best routes a lot easier. Um, link state uh, routing protocols generally use Dijkstra's uh, shortest path first SPF algorithm. It's a complex and processor-intensive method for determining optimal path. Um, I mentioned before, Dijkstra actually, until his uh, death or shortly before his death, taught at UT here in town in the computer science uh, department. This algorithm is probably his his primary contribution to you know, computer science and the like. Um, I think he he taught up until 2000 or 2001. I think he passed away in 2001. Um, routers receive topology information from their neighbors, uh, routers via link state advertisements. So you'll see these, these LSAs uh, go back and forth to um, advertise the topology information. So I, I kind of mentioned this just a second ago as well, but link, stout, link state routing protocols maintain three tables. Um, these are actually kind of not in the right order. Neighbor table is what you're going to actually need to form first, sometimes called an adjacency table. That's as I said before, um, you know, each, each router on that network that's running that particular routing protocol will um, generally respond to a multicast address so that they all know who each other are. And so once all of the routers on the, on the uh, network have advertised themselves to each other, each of those individual routers will build a neighbor table with the IPs of those, or the router IDs of those IP, those uh, routers on the network. Once they've got that information, um, they exchange topology information about their different links between each other. And so based on that, they're able to build a topology table, uh, at, at which point they use some calculations on that topology table and the information they have there to make their routing table. So at all times, a link state routing protocol uh, router is handling three tables. Um, so link state protocols don't have to constantly resend their entire LSA to link state advertisements. Instead, what they do is they send smaller hello LSAs to let their neighbor routers know they are live. So with, um, with routing protocols like RIP and you know, version 1 version 2, they were constantly just you know, always having to send out their entire uh, you know, routing tables to other routers. With uh, link state operations, you, you don't really have to worry about that because unless a topology change has, has happened, um, you're not really going to have any change in the routing or what they need to change um, as far as calculations. So instead, they just send these little LSA hellos, hello messages periodically to let them know, hey, I'm, this neighbor's still here. I haven't, you know, gone offline or stopped functioning for some reason. And if if they, after a certain period of time, they don't receive those LSAs, they'll they'll make the changes they need to. In the event of an actual topology change, though, 
the router that sees that topology change that's you know directly connected on the link that that happens to immediately sends a link state update, an LSU, and that's flooded to all neighbor routers. Um, you can also um, segment uh, link state operation routers into different areas to uh, kind of break down your routing table a little bit easier. So when we talk about link state uh, routing protocols, the one that you're going to the only one you really need to worry about, particularly with the CCNA, is OSPF, Open Shortest Path First. Um, it's completely classless and carries subnet information with all routes. So we, we talked about that before too, you know, classful routing protocols and classless routing protocols. Classful uh, routing protocols have to abide by classful network boundaries, um, whereas classless routing protocols are able to break stuff up into smaller subnets so that uh, you can have uh, you know, variable link subnet masks, and in this case, you, you can do that with OSPF. It's always going to carry the subnet. Because it knows all subnets, the database can become very, very large. Um, if a network grows very large and has flapping issues, it can, can also cause additional performance issues because of the size of the routing updates and the high CPU utilization caused by the SPF algorithm running on every single router. Um, this can be alleviated through the use of areas, which we'll get into later, but um, you know, if you have a if you have a link just go down, you get one um, one or two updates throughout the network that are advertised to all the routers that hey, we've got this single topology change. So they only have to run that algorithm once. But with a flapping issue where the circuit's constantly like bouncing between up and down, up and down, up and down, it's constantly flooding the network with those updates. And as a result of the um, you know the calculations, it can cause some uh, negative network performance. So um, part of uh, trying to assist with um, at least decreasing the size of the tables in an OSPF router, you can, you can break up OSPF into areas to help segment the network. Um, the segmentation allows for route summarization at the intersections of those different areas. Um, if a topology change occurs, only the routers in that area are notified. Um, so the routers at the intersection of any two areas are known as area border routers, or ABRs. And so this is kind of a, um, a very basic uh, OSPF uh, diagram broken up into three areas. We'll go into this a little bit more as well, but um, for an OSPF network, your, your backbone network is always going to be your area zero. If you've only got one uh, area in an OSPF network, it's always going to be an area zero. There has to be an area zero. Um, Whenever you get into like the CCMP stuff, they can talk about very specific situations where, like, say you're trying to con uh, convert two corporate networks into one, and they're both running OSPF and both have an area zero. There's some tactics you can use to, um, you know, connect those two area zeros over a common area and do some translations and things. You're not gonna have to worry about any of that on the CCNA, but uh, you can just kind of think of it as all, there's always gonna be a single area zero on any network you look at. Um, so like in this in this one we've got area 0 and then connected to it are areas 51 and area 1 and these routers right here that uh, sit in between the two areas basically part of it's on area 0 and part of it's on area 51 that's an ABR an area border router so C and E serve the function of an ABR so within area 51 you've got a couple of networks here. You've got this 192.168.101.0/24 and then you've got .100.0/24. Um, in the event like one of these networks goes down or there's some kind of topology change, you're only going to have to notify the routers in this area of that change. And the reason for that is at the area border router, you're going to have an advertisement that um, that basically makes a supernet out of these two routes. So in this case, you got 192.168.100.0/23. That slash 23 is basically going to uh, consist of all of these networks. So if a change occurs, it's not going to matter to anything in area zero or even area one because they they just need to know that they need to route to this larger subnet. Once it gets to this larger subnet, if there's a problem, it can't get to that. You you let these routers worry about that. So that's um, you know, and as a result, these um, like router D. It's not going to have to have the individual subnets for this and this and this and this all in its its routing table. It's only going to have the two supernets, you know, this one right here for this area and this one right here for area one over here. So it it drastically can reduce, you know, especially when you get into larger networks, can drastically reduce the size of the um, the tables 